Good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, January the 12th, 2021. It is currently 12 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, located here in Ovalo, Texas. Now, I'm still not completely sure of exactly what I want to accomplish in this episode, but I I hope that it's going to be beneficial, all right? I, I, I'm, I'm still sitting here trying to process some thoughts because what I'm doing is I've been sitting here at, uh, at the church. I've been doing some live broadcasting, and in between, I keep looking over right here next to me. I have my Kindle on, and it is open to Chapter 1 of the Christian in Complete Armor. Now, we did our introduction. Well, we did an, a historical overview of the author of the Christian in Complete Armor, uh, 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 William Grinnell. Then we looked at the introduction of the book, all right? And now we want to turn to chapter one. But the reason I don't really know what I want to accomplish is I don't really, I don't really want to look at what William Grinnell has to say here. I, I think that he misses something here that I, I'm at least meditating on that I think maybe is a, maybe a significant oversight. I think he he starts chapter one by making possibly a fundamental mistake. And and look, everyone's fallible. So he wrote an, an amazing uh, book, an amazing, you know, three volumes, three volumes on spiritual warfare. It's a classic book. It's, you know, he will be remembered forever. I will be forgotten, you know, half a second after I'm dead. Um, I have accomplished nothing. So I'm by no means trying to offer a, like, I'm not trying to be critical of him. I just think that there, he over, maybe there was a reason he overlooked it. Obviously, I cannot talk to him and ask him. Maybe there was a reason he didn't believe it was necessary to discuss. But I'm sitting here thinking, maybe it is. So here's what I'm going to do. I guess the way I'm going to approach this is I'm going to present my perspective, but I'm presenting my perspective in order to get your thoughts to get your feedback, because I just think it's a major oversight. For those of who, who've read the book, those who've read chapter one, those of you who've taken extensive notes in chapter one and have sent me your notes, you are probably aware of this omission. Uh, you're probably aware of what he decided to skip. He did, I mean, he, he basically right says from the very beginning of chapter, we're going to skip this. We're going to skip this and we're going to move on. And I, and I all of the years I've read the book, I'm like, okay, fine, let's skip it. But for some reason today, just sitting here, keep looking and reading the first part of chapter one over and over and over and over, I'm thinking, wait, I, I don't know if we should skip this. So we're not going to skip it. I, I'm going to present an idea and then I'm going to allow you to tell me what you think, okay? I know I don't <laughs> I don't work through books probably the way you're supposed to, but that's okay. If if you're if you're coming for a if you're looking for me to give a a academic type of lecture about the book, then you're looking in the wrong place. I'm I'm approaching this like hey, let, we're reading this book together and we're talking about it. We're talking about it, right? I want you a part of the conversation. I want you a part of the discussion. Just like I wanted you to be a part of the discussion of the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis and we're still working through that. I like I like us to work through the book together. Like we're we're working through it together and hopefully it will be beneficial. So let's get to it. All right? I'm going to go pick up here <clears throat> The Imitation of Christ, or The Imitation of Christ, The Christian and Complete Armor by William Grinnell. I'm going to turn to chapter one, which I have it right here. And it starts, it says this. This is how my, uh, my copy reads. And again, I'm holding uh, the Kindle version here. And remember, you can gain access to, you can purchase all the books and see which books we're reading and which books I'm suggesting by joining the Theology Central Book Club the, if you haven't joined the Theology Central Book Club, I want you to know that I'm greatly hurt by it because everyone should. Theology Central Book Club, it's very simple. Go to theologycentral.net, go to the blog section, look for the entry, Theology Central Book Club, click on the article, click the link, it'll open up the Theology Central Book Club, join, absolutely free, no purchase is necessary. And whenever I suggest a book, I think you get an email notification uh, that I added another book and you can decide if you want to read it or not. And many of those books that are suggested at some point will be discussed and talked about right here on the Theology Central podcast, where we make theology central. Okay. All right. There we go. 
There's, there's, there's all of the promos. Okay. There's my, my commercials. I don't get any money for any of my commercials. I don't get it. I don't gain anything from it, but those are my commercials here. So here's chapter one. Here's the title for chapter one of Christian courage and resolution, wherefore necessary and how obtained. All right. So immediately, you know what he wants to focus on. In chapter one, he wants to focus on the idea of Christian courage and resolution and that it's necessary and how we get it. How do we get this courage? How do we get this resolution? It's, it's, it's necessary. Why is it necessary? And how do we get it? Now, you can look at that and go, that's what we need to get to. But I think he overlooks something. I think he overlooks something. And you can tell me you agree or disagree. Now, the first thing he says is we shall waive the appellation and begin with the exhortation. Now, I was like, okay, appellation. Now, I, 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 I didn't even read the word last time. I didn't even read the word last time to you. But if you look up the word in a dictionary, which I did here, I think I did. Yes, here, um, uh, appellation. And uh, yes, it, it, it means a name or title. Okay, uh, appellation means a name or title, a name or title. Now, what does he mean here? Let's wave. He says, we shall wave the appellation. What does he mean by that? Okay, well, it's this, it's this idea. He wants us to wave the very first part of Ephesians 6. Let's look at it. Ephesians 6, verse 11, or verse 10, I should say. He wants us to waive this. And the, and the title that he wants us to waive, remember, the, it just the, the word here, ap- appellation, just means a title, just means title, okay? And, it, and the title he's referring to is this, Ephesians 6.10, finally, my brethren, finally, my brethren. That's the name, that's the title that's given to Christians here, to, to fellow believers, Finally, my brethren. Now, there could, be, there could be two reasons he skipped this. The first reason is, according to many, those words, my brethren, finally, my brethren, many believe that they don't belong there. They believe they don't belong there, that they ended up there by accident, that somehow one of the translators or one of the ones who were, you know, copying, you know, the, the manuscripts ended up inserting it there by accident, taking it from somewhere else and saying, hey, this is, this, Paul does this in other places and, and they just placed it there. Others argue that it is present in some manuscripts. So we could sit here and say, maybe he looked, overlooked it because, hey, it's not in some manuscripts and I don't want to turn into a whole discussion about should it be there, shouldn't it be there. So, so maybe he overlooked it for textual reasons. It, it's not in, in, in the text. Now, I would assume that probably the translation he was utilizing, it was there. I mean, well, obviously it was there. He, he acknowledges it's there because he says we're going to skip it. So clearly in whatever translation he was using, it was there. All right. But he decides to skip it. So maybe he skipped it because some people believe and some scholars believe it doesn't belong there. If you look up commentaries, number of commentaries will tell you doesn't belong. This was this was put there by accident. Whatever. Other other commentaries will make an argument that it does show up in some manuscripts, and it makes sense that it's there. All right, we can have that debate. So maybe he decided to leave out again the word he uses. Appellation. There we go. The word he the word he uses. I'll play it for you. The word he uses is. What is it? Appellation, Appellation, right? The word he uses is appellation, which just means name or title. He, maybe he decided to skip the appellation, the the name, the title. Maybe he chose to skip it because um, he didn't, he didn't believe it belonged there. But is it possible that he chose to skip it, decided to just move on because he was in a hurry to get to other things that he thought was more important. And by doing that, maybe he missed out the importance of this phrase. All right, now let's go to Ephesians 6. And I want you to just follow me as I try to kind of offer up a thought here. Ephesians 6, first we have the word finally. In other words, he's going to conclude this epistle to the church at Ephesus with a focus here on, on, well, basically, I mean, at least this initial part 
on spiritual warfare. So finally, finally, in conclusion, finally as we reach the end, here's what I want to emphasize to you, finally. And who is he speaking to? My brethren. My brethren. Now here's the question I have for you. I'm going to pose it as a question first, all right? What do you think the significance is of calling them my brethren? What do you think the significance is? One commentary stated it this way. One commentary stated it this way. I'm going to open up the commentary. It stated it this way. All right, if I can find it, here we go. Um, Finally, my brethren. This is the conclusion of the the apostles' exhortations in which he addresses the saints as his brethren, which appellation he uses, not merely as a familiar way of speaking among the Jews, but in regards to them as regenerate persons and of the same family and household of God with himself. And he calls them so to show his humility and as a proof of his affection to them and as a design to encourage them to their duty as follows. So they say he uses this appellation, this title, right? Not only because it was a familiar way of speaking, but, and here's, uh, and, uh, but in regards to them as regenerate persons. So th- they offer a number of reasons Paul possibly says, my brother. Number one, because it was a familiar way of doing it. Number two, he wanted to regard them as regenerate persons and that they are of the same family in the household of God. So he was referencing them as regenerate persons. Uh, Number three, to show them humility. Hey, brethren, we're we're brothers together. I'm with you. I'm right with you, all right? So So let me go through these again. According to this commentary, this is the reason Paul said, finally, my brethren. Number one, this was a familiar way of speaking among the Jews. Number two, He wanted to regard them as regenerate persons and as of the same family and household of God. Number three, he wanted to show humility. Hey, I'm not better than you. I'm your your brother. We're we're brothers, all right? Number number uh, Number four, as a proof of his affection to them. He wanted to show his affection to them, his love for them by showing them brethren. And lastly, to encourage them to the duties that follow. He's trying to do this, my brethren, to encourage them. So let's go through these again. Number one, he called them my brethren because it was a familiar way of speaking among the Jews. Number two, to regard them as regenerate persons who are of the same family and household of God. Number three, to show humility. Number four, as proof of his affection and love for them. And number five, to encourage them to their duties as follows. All right, I think that's all possible. Now, here's the next question I have for you. How do you think, how how do I want to phrase this question? In what way do you think reminding them that they're brothers, referring to them as brothers, referring to uh, the regenerate persons as brethren, referring to them as being a part of the family of God. What do you think the significance of this truth? That's the way I'll state this. What do you think the significance of this truth that as a believer, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all part of the same family. We're all part of the same household of God. What do you think the importance of this truth is to the subject of spiritual warfare? What do you think the significance is of reminding them, hey, we're all brothers. We're all part of the same household of God. We're all part of the same family. We're all part of the same family. What do you think the significance of that truth is in regards to spiritual warfare? Does it does it make your spiritual warfare more effective in being reminded, brethren, you're part of the same family? In sports... I'm going to use this concept, not in all sports, because some sports are, is very much an, a, an individual competition, right? If you're a tennis player, it's about you versus the other person. 
she, it's, it's the focus is mainly on you. you. You may have coaches, you may have trainers, but which are a significant part, but it's still very individualistic. Um, track and field, depending on the event and many, well, not, not necessarily because sometimes you have a track team and then you rack up points, maybe not so, so much uh, there. Um, mixed martial arts, individualistic, but even there you have to rely on a team uh, to train you. Okay, but there are, I will say there are some sports that are, and I'm just trying to make sure I allow for every um, every possibility, right? Every exception. But t- typically, sports is very much a team-oriented sport, a, t- a team-oriented competition. That's the right way to put it, all right? So I'm, I'm trying to think of any possible exceptions, but I think even in those exceptions, there's a team behind the scene that are very critical and helping you accomplish your individualistic goals. But typically in sports, the success, the the victory typically is not going to occur because of the performance of one individual. Typically, the only way you're going to have ultimate victory, oh, you may win a game, but ultimately a championship will not be accomplished without the team functioning as a team. In other words, sometimes within a team, you have to function as a team, team minded. In other words, I can't, I may have to not worry about my own individualistic goals and what I want to achieve as an individual because I need to function within a team and do what's best for the team. And if everyone's doing their part and everyone's working together and everyone is, is not worried about, hey, you know, like I say some, sometimes in basketball, sometimes passing up a shot so that you pass the ball off to someone else is the right move because that other person has a better chance of getting the shot. And sometimes it's better to pass the ball than shoot the ball for the ultimate goal of the team getting points. Now, you can get that individual statistic and possibly get yourself more points or more shot attempts, but sometimes it's better to sacrifice your own maybe individual success for ultimately working so that the team can be successful so that you can get the ultimate victory. I hope that makes sense. If you're not a sports person, maybe it doesn't, but I think you get the idea that it's that it's a team effort. You need the team. So I wonder in Christian spiritual warfare, if we sometimes look at it at an individualistic perspective, and if we if we overlook that term, finally, my brethren, then then how do we read it? Well, if we skip that, the way William Grinnell says we should skip it, we would read it this way. And this is how most translations have it because they they don't believe the term my brethren belongs belongs there. But um, if you skip it, it's just finally be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It becomes very individualistic. Hey, you, yeah, you right there, you. You be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But if we say, finally, my brethren, hey, brethren, we, all of us, we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We need to put on the armor of God. It's it, it's a, it, it's speaking of more than just the individual. Now, I'm not saying the individual is not being addressed here because clearly this is very individualistic. But remember, he's writing a church, the church at Ephesus. So I'm just con- I've always, I wonder if, I wonder how significant, I'll state it, I'll state it another way. I wonder how significant the brethren, I wonder how significant others are in spiritual victory. I wonder how much we've damaged ourselves in spiritual warfare because we look at it as an individualistic endeavor. Now, I'm going to try to walk. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to offer a lot of thoughts here. I'm going to offer a lot of thoughts. I'm going to offer some personal experience. Now, personal experience does not equate to truth. Please understand that. In my own Christian life, I have felt continually, probably almost consistently, that I don't really belong and don't really fit in with other Christians. I, when I became a Christian, I, I, I had this very like naive attitude. Oh, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. We're all together. Yay. We're all going to be on the same team and we're all going to work together. And it took me about 15 minutes to realize, 
whoa, wait a minute. I, you know, I, I don't cross the T right. I don't dot the I right. So I don't really fit in. And I, I, I basically realized I was just as much an outsider within Christianity as I felt in the world that I didn't get fit, fit in and get along with any, I didn't fit in with anyone at high school, didn't get along with anyone in high school. I was, I was the outsider and I, and I welcomed being the outsider. I didn't care to fit in uh, because I, I always had this mentality that me, myself and I, we get along very well and other people want you to conform and they want you to be a certain way and, and you have to do certain things to get their approval. And I was like, I don't look, if I have to compromise to get your approval, then I don't want your approval. So, um, but I thought Christianity was going to be different. So I became a Christian and I can remember very specific events where I'm like, Hey guys, you know, uh, so what, what, you know, what sermon did you listen to? Or, Hey, what, what book did you read? Or, Hey, uh, did what did you do for Bible study? And Hey, how about on Friday night? I remember trying to get all of the uh, young people to show up to the church on Friday night. And we were going to, I wanted everyone to like, we were going to work on the book of Leviticus. You know how many people showed up? I was sitting in the sanctuary by myself. Nobody. Nobody showed up. None. And I have found myself in a number of situations where I'm like, hey, Christians, let's get together to do this. And it's a spiritual activity, a spiritual activity, right? Spiritual activity. Keep that in mind. And no, no takers. Nope. None. And then you talk to Christians, hey, what did you read? What did you study? Let's move on. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about something else. And I've always found myself that like when, when Christians would get together, let's say for a potluck or a fellowship, because for some reason, the Christian mind is, hey, the way we show that we're unified, the way we show, I guess, the Christian fellowship equates to, you know, getting together and eating food. And I would find myself at these fellowship activities and I would be like, all right, so the men are over there talking about a truck and a new engine in the truck and they're all over there standing around looking at this car. I could care less about engines, about cars. I have no interest in any of that. Don't, I can't even talk about any of that because I don't care. Or they're talking about, yeah, uh, got the deer blind set up, going to go hunting and kill some deer. And I'm like, okay, I don't own a gun. I don't hunt. Um, so I don't really have much to say with that. Or they may be talking about some political perspectives that I clearly don't hold to. Sometimes they're talking about sports and I could engage in some of that. Um, but they didn't, they definitely were not going to be talking about any of the things that I was interested in, right? Um, I'll go through some of my top interests. Music. All right, though, that's a no-no in Christianity. So you didn't fit in. <laughs> Let's not talking about music. Okay, so I, okay, that so I don't fit in there. Okay. Oh, I love professional wrestling. Okay, well, that we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about that. Oh, I love uh, to read. Anybody ready? Uh, oh nope. Now, sadly, sadly, what I've found is that typically it would be women in the church who would be reading like, oh, I read this book and I read this book and I read this the- theology book and I'm like, and I read the Puritans and I'm like, why is it a woman who's reading and, spe- and, and, and listening to sermons and I can't get the men to like seem to even want to talk about anything related to God? Why is it women? I, I've, 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 I've encountered that my whole Christian life. It's the women who want to read and study. It's the w- women carrying a notebook. It's the women, and it's not the men like, oh, no, not, and I'm like, what is wrong? Now, I'm not saying that's always the rule, just saying that, that that's what happens. So, I, so I'm like, okay, so can I go over to the, sit with the women? Can I go sit with the women at this potluck? Can I go sit with the women? Because they're talking about, oh, they're going to, oh, they're going to talk about, they're going to, they're going to ask me a theological question. Okay, where, where's the women? Okay, like, what, like, but I didn't have anything in common. So I, I want to talk about analyzing movies. No, I don't want to talk about that. I, I, so I just found myself like, okay, so I don't really fit in. I don't really fit in here. And so I kind of just over time, and I'm just, and I could give example after example. I don't want to go through it all, but I just, in other words, I just started feeling like, what, what connection is here? Like, what, what where are we connected here? Like, well, what, what, like, have a fellowship because we, well, what are we fellowshipping around? The only thing we have in common is the food we're shoving in our mouth. And in many cases, I don't even have that in common because in many cases, I don't even care. I don't care about food and don't even care to eat it. So, but all right. So, uh, and I'm always like, where, where's the fellowship? Where is the fellowship? I don't see the fellowship. You know, we have something in common. 
So I, so I kind of developed an attitude early on in my Christian life that my Christian life, me growing as a Christian, learning as a Christian, was really going to be me, myself, and I. In other words, nobody seemed to be out there, like I, I nobody seemed to be really involved in trying to help me or, or it just, in fact, in many cases, it seems the people who wanted to drop a bucket of water on any spiritual fire would be Christians. Even, even all of the years of doing Christian podcasts, the people who are the most discouraging, the most attacking, the most condemning, the most aggressive have always been Christians. Now, yes, there have been Christians who have been very kind and very supportive and very encouraging. And I'm think I'm thinking that, but they're always in the, I'm telling you, the minority of the minority of the minority. I can get a hundred emails and two will be encouraging and 98 will be like, you're an idiot and you're going to burn in hell, you piece of garbage. I mean, I, in fact, I could read a comment I just got uh, not too long ago that was basically saying I'm going to go, I'm going to burn in hell and that I, my mind has been blinded by Satan and I'm a tool of Satan. Well, th- okay, thank you. Thank you for such encouraging words. Um, and I've, I I started thinking, you know, I'm just... I, it's me, myself, and I. Even, even when I was a young, quote-unquote, preacher boy, and I wanted to be in the ministry, and I remember going to certain conferences where there's other pastors, and I was always just, like, ignored. Just, eh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because I don't know, I didn't, I didn't talk like a preacher. I, I, I don't know what. Now, I know part of the reasons back then is when I was, like, 25, I looked like I was 14. I think when I was 27, I still looked like I was, like, you know, maybe 17. So I was just viewed as always, like, I can remember when I was kind of serving as the youth director and we would go to a youth function with other churches. The rest of the pastors treated me like I was one of the teenagers. They never treated me like I was the youth director. It was, it was, it was very frustrating. But again, I felt this like isolation that I'm alone. I didn't feel like my brethren, we're in this together. I felt like, okay, I've got, I'm fighting this war on my own. I'm, I, I don't have anything in common with any Christians. I, I don't, I don't have anything in common. That's not a good place to be. I, I thought that that's the way it was. But maybe, maybe what is significant in Christian warfare is maybe there's got to be something about needing others. And I, and I know there's an individualistic part of it because ultimately your Christian life is going to, like ultimately your Christian life is determined ultimately by you. I mean, I mean, sadly to say, Christians may sometimes be the most the most detrimental to your Christian advancement. So, but th- is there an aspect where that is an inherent flaw in the way we fight the spiritual war? Is that we have a lot of individual Christian soldiers all running around trying to fight their war? Now, I'm not. Call- I'm, listen, listen to me. I'm not talking about some ecumenical where we all come together and throw out doctrine and throw out theology. A lot of Christians have attempted that. No, you can never have unity at the expense of truth. Never, never. But within our individual bodies, what can we do to assist one another in it? Now, nobody really ever knows because what it always comes down to, well, we need to spend time together. And what do you want to do? We want to, we need to get together and eat. We need to have a potluck. We need to have a picnic. We need to have a camping trip. We need to have a hunting trip. And it's always some like activity for fun, right? And, or, and it's always like, this, this is what we need. Without this, our Christian life is destroyed. And I'm like, do you really need it for your Christian life or you just want to go have some fun? It's never like we need to get together to, or, or they say we need to get together in, in small groups. And then the small groups are supposed to be a time of, of, of extensive discipleship and prayer and, and confession. And what is it? to send into, well, we got to have some food. So we'll have a very quick devotional. And then we're going to sit around talking about the weather and I don't know, whatever we talk about and spiritual spirituality gets set aside and it becomes almost a community club. Well, that doesn't seem like my brother and we're in the middle of a war. We need to be together. I see my, finally my brethren and then he getting ready to go into a, um, getting ready to go into a discussion about spiritual warfare, it's almost like, uh, how, can I, how can I describe it? I'll try to use a military idea of fall in, fall in. 
in. And then that means you fall in. You all fall into formation. You all, you all start getting, you know, spacing yourself, getting it right. Then boom, fall into attention. And, uh, and you're all standing in, in formation, ready to go to get to, to receive those orders. Whether it's, you know, we're going to march, you know, left, hey, or whatever, you, whatever we're, we're going to do, right? I'll, I'll, we could go through all the marching commands. You're going to get the commands and then that formation is going to move in whichever direction and whatever we're going to do or this is what we're going to do. That you, you fall in to receive the order. Finally, my brethren, brothers, family of God, fall in. I've got some final instructions for you. Together, together as a unit, you got to function as a unit. You can't function as individuals. Now you have individual responsibilities, but we've got to come together to fight this spiritual war. And, and, I, and I feel like, and even, especially since 2016, when the whole Christian nationalism and politics came in, it's now that we, we, we're, we're divided even by our political affiliation. Like we're not finally my brother and we're like, finally... And the only people who are brothers are people who support Trump. If you don't support Trump, you're a baby-killing communist who wants to uh, bring Satanism upon everyone, and you're trying to chip everyone, and you're a part of the New World Order. And it's like, what just happened? So now my, my identity in Christ is identified if I wear a Make America Great hat again? That's, that's now my identity? What happened? And I think sometimes our... our our failure in spiritual warfare is because it's not finally my brethren. Do, do you think there's any truth to that? I'm just throwing, I'm just throwing the idea out there. I'm just, and, and again, I don't have any easy answers because I know a lot of Christians have struggled with, it feels like you just come to church, you do your thing, and you go to, and then everyone just goes out and, do, and lives life. Well, in some ways you have to do that, right? I mean, some ways you have to do that because, I mean, you got lives to live, you got responsibilities, you, you do that. And the older you get, I mean, that's just, look, the reality. When you're young, you're like, hey, go to work, then go hang out with friends, and then go here, and go here, go, 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 go. And then as you get older, it's like, nah, not so much go, 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 go. How about let's just sit at home? Nah, I don't, and it's not even about not hanging out with people. It's like you just don't even go out for certain activities. You you lessen the activity. How can we still be finally my brethren. Now, I know, I'm, again, I understand some don't believe it's in the text. I'm just saying, is the idea of together in the war significant for accomplishing, for accomplishing the war, for, for, for finding victory within the war? Like, you can't have a military unit, Right? where you're in the middle engaging in combat and everyone just jumps out and starts taking off to go do whatever they think they need to do. No, they, the, the, the unit has to stay together, then they receive orders, and then they have to carry out those orders as a unit. Now, that you, some people may be sent one direction or paired off to do this or to do that, but you're still functioning as a unit. You're, you're not just out there trying to accomplish an individualistic thing. You're trying to accomplish the mission. The mission involves everyone and everyone has a part to play in that mission. I, I, I don't have a good answer here. I don't have a good answer. I just, I just, when I looked at it, I'm like, you know, he, again, the, he, he waves it. Let me read it again. I got to turn my Kindle back on. He just waves it. And I just think it's, in, I, there's, maybe it's not significant. We shall wave the appellation and begin with the exhortation. That's how, that's what he, we shall wave it. We're just going to skip it. Finally, my brother. Now, he may do so because of textual reasons. But do you think there's a part of us that we all wave it? Hey, spiritual warfare, what can I do? My armor. I do this. I do this. But maybe we need one another. And I just thought of some scriptures. I just wrote down a few scriptures. And again, I don't know. I'm not. There's no easy. The church has tried. The church throughout church history has tried all kinds of different things to to try to accomplish it because the church does not function. Look, let's just be honest. The church today does not function as it did in Acts. In Acts, they sold all of their possessions. They had all thing in common. Like we don't operate that way. We have our own houses. We have our own property. We have our own money. We, we, we have our own individual lives with our own goals, our own hobbies, our own desires. 
And, and there's a very individualistic aspect of it. And sadly, there's not even a lot. Of, sometimes there's not even the same amount of, hung, of, of spiritual desire amongst Christians. And so and, and I I'll, will state this. The only thing we have in common, and, and I cannot stress this enough, the only thing that produces spiritual unity among the brethren, like we see ourselves as brothers, is our faith in Christ. Like if we, if we try to get together, we're, we don't have anything else in common. I don't have anything else in common with most Christians, right? I don't. But you know what I do have in common with them? Christ, the scriptures, prayer, intercession, petition, confession. You know what, I have, you know what else I have in common with them? I'm a sinner and they're a sinner. They fell and I fell. You know what I also have in common with them? We have a saint, we have an enemy. Satan, who roams about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. They, they're they under the same threat that I am. You know what other threats they have? They have the world. You know what other threat they have? The flesh. We all have the same threats. We're supposed to believe in obviously the same God. We should be meditating on the same book, the word of God, day and night. We're in it together. And I think it's important, like, if, if you can get, like, the the... I've, I've always, tr- I've tried to do this throughout my ministry. It's like, okay, this year, church, we're going to do this together. We're going to read together. We're going to do the devotionals together. And what I have found in so many cases is those attempts that only certain people will participate and everyone else is like, nope, going to do what I want, not going to do it. And you're like, come on. We, but, but at the same time, they'll be the ones like, we need, you know, uh, we need to have a fellowship where we can all get together. Well, we're no fellowship. You won't even participate in what the church, what the church has called you to participate in. So it's, it's really, I think we're very a disorganized and disuni, disunified or a, a not, a not unified army. And remember Paul, that was his problem with the church of Corinth. Hey, there's, there's division among you. There's schism. There's disunity. You're fighting, you're arguing, you're bickering. You're breaking into little cliques. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. When we do that, I think that we become vulnerable to attack. We can't accomplish it. So I, there's some scriptures I wrote down. There's some scriptures I wrote down. Um, I, wrote, I wrote Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 28 through 29. Galatians 3, 28 through 29. All right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Paul telling the church at Galatia, and they had all their problems. They were, they were divided, all the issues that were going on. And he reminds them, verse 27, for as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is your unity to Christ. You've been, you've been immersed and unified in, into Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. You're all one in Christ Jesus. There's this unity that is that we're one in Christ Jesus. We're not one in our political affiliations. We're not one in our hobbies. We're not one in our goals. Well, we should have the goal to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we have personal goals, personal ambitions, person, personal interests, personal likes and dislikes. I've, I've got a lot of people in my church who love the outdoors. Well, wonderful. I'm not getting anywhere near the outdoors other than to get into my car so I can get inside another building. I don't want to go outside for anything. Okay. But, that, but that's okay. That's their interest. My, we're different. But guess what we have in common? We're, we're one in Christ Jesus. And that oneness how it manifests itself, it, it, look, it may not be able to always manifest. I, I think this is what we do. We always want to manifest our unity or our oneness in Christ in the most superficial ways, right? Hey, we'll have a potluck. We'll all get together and put some fried chicken in our mouth. Look at us. We're all one. Well, that's just superficial. That, that, the fact that we're brothers in the Lord, that we're brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we're one in Christ needs to be manifest itself and uh, at least I'm going to use it in this context, and our spiritual battle and our spiritual war, that we're there to restore someone. We're there to pick someone back up. We're there to pray for one another. We're there to encourage one, encourage one another. We're there to, and not just the pastor and the people and the people to the pastor, the people amongst the people, encouraging one another, challenging one another, restoring one another. Hell, a lot of times, the, the I was going to say helping one another, and I cut myself off. I, I do that all the time. 
But we, I think we have a tendency to that everything has to be structured. Like there has to be a meeting. There has to be a, there has to be a group. There has to be a, a time there. Like, no, I think the, 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 the unity is where Christians are helping Christians in their spiritual war. They're helping, encouraging, protecting, looking after. In other words, it doesn't have to be an organized thing. We don't have to organize it. It's a reality. We're one in Christ. So what are you doing? Don't, don't, it's always like, I think what church, a lot of church members do, what should the, what should the church should do? Well, all the church can ever do is just hold an event. Create a, a new, a new time that you have to meet. Hey, well, you know, we're, we're meeting at church, but now we need to meet in uh, small groups. We need to meet in small groups because we got to accomplish it. And, and that it's always another, another meeting. It's always another function. It's always, and it's always, that's always the solution. And I think that gives us the illusion that finally, my brethren, we're in this together. We're, I, I think the reality is it, it, it's something deeper. I don't think it can be, I don't think it can clearly be seen by simply a group or a time or a meeting or a place or how often together. There's this, this idea that we're looking out for one another when someone falls, we, we come together to restore someone. We're praying for one another. We are encouraging, encouraging. Uh, that's, I, again, I think that's a very, I think Christians do a lot of discouraging. We encourage. I, th- I think we've got to figure out how to get that together. We're one in Christ. And I just want to make sure we stress that. The oneness is in Christ. I, th- I think, I know for many Christians, since Trump was elected, they felt like an outcast in a lot of Christianity. And a lot of Christians were out there saying really garbage things. Like, hey, if you don't Trump support, you're not a Christian. Literally, if you don't tr- support Trump, you're a baby killer. I literally have seen Christian articles stating this kind of nonsense. I'm like, you hate America. How about I'm a Christian? How about you're a Christian? How about we focus that our, we're unified in Christ? You got a political opinion. I got a political opinion. But the Bible doesn't say anything about our political opinions. Now, if the Bible was going to call for division, it's among theological lines, not political lines. And I'll say, well, that my politics is a reflection on my theology. No, I no. Listen, I can uh, I can theologically believe life begins at conception, but not agree with your political solution or your political compromise to try to accomplish that solution or your moral compromise to accomplish that that solution. We can disagree on that. That's why we have to find our unity in Christ. But we're one in Christ. That was Galatians chapter three. Verse uh, 28, Galatians 3, 28. Got to look at my notebook over here. I wrote another one down. And this is the one that everyone goes to. Acts 2, 42. Acts 2, 42. Acts 2, 42. And we all know this is the early church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Right? Uh, so they can st- they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We need a doctrinal unity. We do need a doctrinal unity, um, and fellowship. And I, I think that fellowship is around the Word of God. That's look. Here's when here's when the when we this is when my church has everything in common. You know when, when we, we we can have true fellowship when the Bible is opened and it's preached. That's fellowship. Why? Because at that moment we all have everything in common. The Word of God. When we gather to partake of the Lord's Supper fellowship because we're all gathered around to remember the the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When we sing together, we are worshiping God. We have something in common. We're worshiping God. If we pray, we are praying together. Those are the, that's when we have true fellowship. That's when we have true fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. All right? And then uh and and then uh verse 46 uh, Acts two forty six, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and met, they met every single day. Which we don't we don't do that anymore. But again, there was a there was a unity, there was a togetherness, and I know that some of that is broken by the culture in which we live. We don't live as close together as may have been at the time at, 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 in these times. Uh, we're, we're far more separated and we have uh, so many ac- activities and, and actions and so much uh, pulling for our attention. 
Again, so I'm not calling for let's let's create another meeting. Let's create another, you know, let's let's put something else in our calendar that we have to do. Just there's got to be this. We always have to remember that we are unified in Christ, that we're one and that that somehow we should be working together to help each other in the spiritual war. That's the best way I can I can put it. Um, John 17, John chapter 17, Christ's high priestly prayer. Look what he prays. You know this. John 17, 21. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 21, that they, uh, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Calling for a oneness. Now, we are ultimately one in Christ. We are one um, because we are, you could talk about um, we are placed into one body. By we we could get into a discussion of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we, we would say don't does not happen subsequent to salvation, but it's a part of salvation where we are placed into the body of Christ, and the Spirit is placed into us. And we are in Christ. We could get into a whole theological discussion there, but I I just think that he waves that, and again I understand there's a textual reason to wave it. Finally, my brethren, my brethren is missing from lots of manuscripts. I understand that. But do you think there's something to it? What, let, let, me, let me phrase it this way. What do you think you can do right now? Right now. What do you think you can do to encourage a brother or a sister in their spiritual battle? Because they're in a spiritual battle. You are as well. What do you think you can do for your fellow Christian. Now, I'm not saying compromise doctrine. I'm not saying compromise doctrine. I'm not saying compromise theology. But what do you think can be done? We, we've spent so much time, I, I, think, I think, since the election of Trump, fighting one another over politics. It's almost political unity or division. And that, I think, has made us weak spiritually, which I think has made us so vulnerable to spiritual attack and maybe why I believe the church is losing the spiritual war because we broke into political factions and we should have never done that because we're one in Christ Jesus. And our focus is not on politics or a political solution to the problems in this world. It's in Christ Jesus. We, we fell for conspiracy theories and nonsense. What do we have to do? And then I'm going to go back and I'll end with this. And I know I don't have a, a great way of saying this, but let's, let's, I'm going to just do this. All right, let me go back. All right, here we go. Back to the uh, Christian and complete armor. We shall waive the appellation um, and begin with the exhortation. Be strong. That is, be of good courage. Be strong. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to open up my Bible really quick. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. What can you do and what can I do together to help facilitate strength in the Lord for our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord? What can we do to strengthen our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, to, to strengthen them in the Lord? What can we do? What can we do to facilitate that, to encourage that? Be strong in the Lord. What can we do to help them be strong in the Lord? What can we do? What can we do? I'll, I'll just end with this kind of an example. Maybe this will help. Maybe it will not. I was in the, uh, obviously, obviously I was in the United States military for a very long time. And a lot of my discussion here is kind of, I've tried to use some military ideas. But there was a person, I wasn't close with them, didn't hang out with them, didn't talk to them. We didn't eat together, nothing like that. But there was this person that it was, it was becoming common knowledge that, hey, if they fail their next PT test, they're going to get kicked out of the military. Their military, they've got one chance to pass this test and it's over. And it started and, you know, spreading. And again, remember, I worked in the medical world, so I was in a hospital. So, you know, different than other military units, uh, but in a uh, hospital. And so it was like, hey, you know, she's going out there uh, today and she's going to be doing this. She's got to pass this. And I was like, okay, I wasn't giving much thought. And then someone was like, oh, there she is. And I'm like, what? And we were out like on the second floor of the hospital. And I looked over I'm like, there she is. She just, she just started, you know, not too long ago. And I'm like, oh boy. And I'm like, if she doesn't pass this, her career is over. And I'm like, well, what are we doing in here? So I'm, 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 I'm in my full uniform, um, you know, my, my, uh, 
be, I think they were called battle dress uh, uniform of the day, not not the, the the blue uniform in the Air Force, but the, the camouflage kind of uniform that you may be aware of if you're not used to military terminology. Okay, so I so I had my boots on, my military uniform, and I was like, well. I'm not going to let her go down. If she's going to fail this test, she's going to do it over my dead body. So I took off, ran to the stairs, ran down two flats, flights of stairs, ran across the, it's called the horseshoe part of the parking lot, ran over, fa- caught up with her, and she's in the first half of of, 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 of the running. And I, I come running right along next si- side of her, and she looked over, and I'm like, you're not failing this test. You're not failing this test. She didn't know me very well. I'm like, we're going to do this together. So I just started running. I started running. I'm like, come on, come on. You know, I, I tried to ensure that I didn't give her too much of a pace. I just thought, we can do this. We can do this. I, and, and the reason I, I, one of the reasons I decided to do it is everyone in the hospital knew that if there was one person who hated to run, it was me. I skipped every PT training session that I could. I, my, my philosophy was, I don't need to do, I don't need to exercise. Just when it's time for my test, I'm going to pass that test even if I die at the end because I'm not wasting my time to exercise, but I'm going to pass this test. And I, and I would always try to get a 90 or above so that I could get like a three-day pass so I could get time off. But I did not, I, 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 my, I worked with the doctors that always helped me get out of going to exercise. So I never exercised, but I always passed my test. Right now, now sometimes I struggled, and and there were times I had some people who helped me out, but I was like, so I knew that she had to know that he hate if he's out here running, and I even I think my my words I said to her is like, look, I hate this more than you do, I cannot stand running, but we're gonna do this, so we just started running. And, and that first half, I didn't say very many words because I was like, you know, it's going to be embarrassing if I fall over on the side of the road and uh, she has to finish the race. She's like, thanks for your help. You know, and Because I, I was like, oh, okay, I, I got to catch my breath here. Okay, I'm not going to make this. But I knew that I had to do it. I knew that I had to get her to that finish line. And I knew, and it wasn't about, oh, we, we met together and that we had to, it wasn't about like some, like we always this was not surface level support. This was not surface level help. This was like, this is where it really gets real. So I, I ran, I ran, we, we get to what, what was the turning point. And then we had, we turned around to run back to the finish start line. Okay. This was now the second half of the race. This is where your time, I think this is where you're either going to lose time or make time. So I started picking up the pace just slightly. I'm like, okay, come on. We can do this. We did. And, and she was like, she was grabbing her side. She was so she's like, I can't, I can't. I'm like, look, this is killing me too. Come on, please. This is your career, your career. And I was, and I was trying to talk, but I mean, it was like, you can, you can, you can, please, you can. Because I, I was about to pass out too. And so we kept going, we kept going. We started rounding the curve and we probably had, I don't know, 200 yards, 150 yards. And this is where I always like, this is, this is make it or break it right here. Cause I don't know what, I don't know what's on the time. I don't have a watch here. She didn't have a watch. I'm like, I don't know what's on. I don't know how much time you have, but this is it. We're, we're, you're going to, your career is over or you're going to save your career right here. Let's sprint. I said, full out everything you've got. If you pass out at the end, we're at a hospital. You're going to, let's do it. And I started running and as fast as I could, and, and I and I and I said, I'm you keep up with me. And I just started sprinting as fast as I could. She was coming up behind me. She was, I mean, she was moving. And we crossed that finish line, and boom! I mean, I went down. I thought I was dead. She she stood up, and so I think she started laughing because I was like laying there, like it's the end of me. And trust me, trying to run in, in combat boots is not the easiest thing in the world to do. But I, I we finished and. They looked over, they started calculating it, and she made it. It was, I don't remember what it was, five seconds, 10 seconds. She just barely made it, and she saved her career. That, to me, is what it means to be finally my brethren. It's not about, oh, we got to meet together. Oh, no, it's about we do whatever we can do. Now, I, yes, you got to encourage people. Sometimes you have to contact people. Sometimes you have to look out for people. Sometimes you're just praying for people. They don't have to know you're praying for them. Sometimes you just, you don't have to tell people. You don't have to be a part of a prayer group. You just know the Christians you know. You know the people in your church. And you know, look for ways to encourage. When they need help, help. I I know churches are great about, we have a potluck every month. But when someone truly needs actual help, it'll like, we'll pray for you, but they don't do anything to actually assist them. It's really putting forth the effort 
to say, finally, my brethren, be strong. I'm going to help you be strong in the Lord. I'm going to do what I can to strength, to, to, to you find strength in the Lord and that we find it together. I just think that there's got to be some consideration of how that principle applies. I know that doesn't get us into the chapter, but just when he says, I'm going to wave the appellation there, I'm going to wave the title, my brethren, I know he may be doing it because of textual reasons, or maybe he just felt that be strong in the Lord is what we needed to get to. But I think we got to get to being strong in the Lord together. What do you think? Email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a great day. God bless.